Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Suffolk Legal Innovation and Technology Lab's first Wednesday workshops for the Document Assembly Line community. These workshops are a chance to dive deeper into topics related to building guided interviews in DocAssemble and using the Document Assembly Line tools. Today's topic is GitHub DocAssemble workflows, and our expert guest is me. I will ask myself to introduce myself in a minute. Uh, first, this workshop is being recorded, and we'll share it on our YouTube channel. To find it, just check our blog on SuffolkLitLab.org or search for Suffolk Lit Lab on YouTube. You can use the chat to ask questions during the workshop. I will try to call attention to your questions as we go. Guest video is disabled, but since it often helps to share your screen to demonstrate a problem, you can do that. Just please wait until I invite you to. Before we dive in, if you're hearing about the Lit Lab or the document assembly line for the first time, head over to SuffolkLitLab.org to learn more. Everyone who uses DocAssemble and the document assembly line tools is welcome to attend our weekly community meetings, join our community forum on Microsoft Teams, and attend these workshops. If you'd like to join us, email us at litlab at suffolk.edu, and we'll hook you up. So let's get started. I'm going to introduce myself, and then we'll go ahead and take it from there. Um, and I'm going to share my screen here, too, in just a moment. OK. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I come to the Lit Lab um, after starting a, a website, lawyerist.com, which I left a few years, well, right as the pandemic was breaking. Um, there on the front end, I hosted a podcast and did other things. On the back end, I did all of our web development. I maintained the website. I built tools for our community, all kinds of stuff like that. So um, if you want to know more about my sort of personal projects, um, you can see it on my website. But what's relevant to now is I've been using GitHub for years. So I'm going to walk through some of that with y'all. Um, I'm going to throw in the chat a link to our GitHub documentation on our documentation website. I recently updated that. I need to do more updating. This is a living website. It's a living document that we um, that I'm trying to update as I learn more about how we do things. Because at the Lit Lab, my job is to sort of manage the um, the document assembly line as a system. You know how how to how to use GitHub as well as all the other document assembly line tools uh, to build interviews. Quinton is the lead of the project. He develops the tools. Um, he and David are the ones who brought the document assembly line into being. Um, but my job is, among other things, to keep that documentation up to date um, and current so that it describes how to successfully build interviews with documents, doc assemble and the assembly line tools. Um, and one of those small pieces of that is GitHub. Over the summer, I was helping um, work on project management with some work study students and volunteers who were helping us build interviews, doc assemble interviews for the Massachusetts trial court. And one of the sticking points was using GitHub. And so that's why I wanted, that's why I updated this page. That's why I wanted to do this, um, this workshop to talk about how to use GitHub. Even in talking with some of the folks in the community, um, I understand people are sort of reluctant to use GitHub as GitHub, um, but only from, you know, as sort of an, ex, uh, an elaborate way to save um, state of your document assembly line, your doc assemble interviews. Um, so I'd like to talk about GitHub in that respect, but also just how to use GitHub as GitHub. You are welcome to ask questions at any point. I will keep an eye on the chat. I will keep it open um, and I will try to answer them as we go or at a time where it seems to fit into what we're talking about. So what I want to do now is kind of start from the beginning and talk about how to get interviews into GitHub. I think a lot of you already know that, but let's go ahead and cover it. Um, let's talk about um, how what the workflow looks like when you're working with, say, two or three or five or 20 people on one code, um, one code base, one interview repository in GitHub, um, and also how you merge uh, conflicting changes in that um, back into it. So please ask questions. Um, I will talk about how I use GitHub um, before and how I interact with it in the context of DocAssemble, um, but I'd I want to address your questions too. Um, one of which came from Caroline Robinson in Teams earlier, and maybe I'll be able to cover that here too. Um, I think um, she'll be able to grok the answer from what we're talking about here. So let's start as we do with DocAssemble in the playground. Um, this is an interview I was just playing around with to see what it would look like to use DocAssemble to build um, 
an interview that asks the kinds of questions I usually ask at the beginning of our weekly community meetings. Um, just thinking about ways to be more efficient with our time. Not sure this is something I'm going to use, but it makes a good test case for what we're doing here because I haven't done anything with it. So you can think of this as if you've used the document assembly line Weaver tool uh, to generate a draft of your interview, you, this is you're going to end up with something like this too. Um, there's no template in this one, but so we're basically starting from nearly the same point you would if you had just created an interview from the Weaver and added it to the playground. So let's start there. This assumes you've already configured GitHub for your DocAssemble uh, development server, um, which we have. So I'm not going to cover that. Um, that's server level stuff. We can talk about that in another, another day if we need to. But the directions are pretty clear on, uh, and pretty straightforward on the DocAssemble documentation if you need it. So we're instead going to start from how to publish your interview on GitHub after you have one. So whether you started it from scratch like I did, or you generated it from, from a PDF or a doc, DocX um, in the Weaver, you're going to end up here in the playground with a project. And we haven't done anything with GitHub yet. So to, get, to start in GitHub, we're going to go to the folders and packages. Um, if you don't already have a package name, you're going to want to create it at this point. I believe the Weaver does that for you. Um, I called mine daily standup. Um, and uh, if you scroll down here, uh, you're going to want to make sure um, you, it's a good idea to change the description at this point. Um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and do that. So because um, that ends up populating into GitHub. And a lot of people never bother changing it, so might as well change it now. Um, and I think now is a good time to do it. You want to make sure that your interview file is selected right here. And then we're going to go down the bottom. Um, in the README file, it's a good idea to describe what the README file does. Um, and I'm just going to copy the description from above so that we can keep moving here, because if I try to write something, it'll take me forever because I'm a slow writer. But now we want to click on the GitHub button. And for the initial commit, you can just click, you can just write initial commit. That's if I can use my keyboard here. For the installed package on this server also, my understanding is there's almost never a reason to use this and it'll probably be, make things more complicated if you do. So pretend like that's not there and we're gonna click commit. Here's what this does. This pushes the interview file in, in the DocAssemble folder structure to my GitHub account. So um, let's wait for it to finish, and then I'll move over to my GitHub account, and we should see that there. Push commit to GitHub, did all the stuff. What's the warning? Permanently added to the list of known hosts, no big deal. OK, so we should go over to my GitHub account, and um, we may even see it. I'll go to my repository, my repositories. And there we go. DocAssemble daily standup is the new interview file I just did. Now the next step, because it automatically goes to my personal GitHub profile, which is not actually what we want, right? So we're going to do this on GitHub. We're going to go here and we're going to the settings and um, we're going to transfer ownership and we're going to change it now. You need to be a member of the organization to transfer it directly this way. I am, so I can do that. Michelle says, when you see a blue message up here, that means success. So if you don't want to interpret all of that. So uh, I'm lazy, so I'm going to copy and paste this if it lets me. There we go. Um, I don't need to give any Teams access to that, so I'm just going to transfer it to Suffolk Lit Lab. And let's find out now if that worked. Um, I guess I, I still haven't figured out the best way to go to Suffolk Lit Lab's repository, so I usually end up clicking through a couple of things. Um, but in any case, here we go. So we've got it. The DocAssemble daily standup repository is in GitHub, um, which is where it belongs. Now, obviously, if you're a member of a different legal aid organization, you want to transfer to that organization's GitHub organization um, so that it's associated with that thing. 
Um, you can transfer them between it. Sometimes transferring around is a little convoluted as some of you have experienced as we've done this, but um, you, we can get it done. You want it to be in the right place because if somebody comes and visits your organization, you want them to be able to see the interviews that you're working on. Um, okay, so now we've got it in the place where it belongs. In preparation for the next step, I'm going to copy up here. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the playground. And now that we've published this project, we don't want to use it anymore. So we're going to go to Manage Projects. And we're going to create a new project. And we're going to do this as if we were interviewer one. So we're going to do this as if we're part of a team. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to add comment. Whoops. Um, no hyphens there, we're using camel case. So um, we're gonna do it as if we're adding a comment because that's what we're gonna do so that we can demonstrate pull requests and things down the road here. Um, and now we want to go again to folders and packages and we're gonna pull, I'm gonna paste that URL of my GitHub repository in here and we're gonna pull it from the main branch and it should take, I'm sure it's gonna churn for a moment, hardly. Okay, so now we should be able to go back and we've got the code that we had before. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave a comment on here. I think by now we all know what that is. And we're gonna call it interviewer one. We're gonna save it. And now because we've made a change, let's say if you're, obviously ordinarily you're gonna do a lot more changes. But one of the things to keep in mind is when you create a new project and a topic branch, which is what we're gonna talk about here, you wanna do it to do one thing at a time. So. I'd made this entire project to make this one comment. Maybe that's a little too small, but I, if I wanna add a question or change a question or troubleshoot a question, what you're gonna to wanna to do is create a new project for just that task, that discrete task. Um, because when you, when you keep things packaged up small like that, it makes things a lot easier down the road. And we're gonna try and show a merge conflict too. So, um, so we're gonna go back to folders and packages. Let's imagine I've spent the last three days troubleshooting this thing and I've figured it out now and I'm pretty happy with it. Um, so let's go down to the bottom. We're gonna go back down to GitHub and now we're gonna commit it, but we're gonna commit it to a new branch, not back to main. Um, interviewer one, add comments. Now, the name of your branch and the name of your packages can be related. I think ordinarily they probably are, but they don't necessarily have to be. Um, but I like to do it this way because um, it keeps it together. Um, oh, good question, Emily. I didn't actually mention this. Emily wants to know why do we need to create a new project in the playground? Couldn't you just um, use the same project? You can, but things might get messy. Um, and the reason is because the way DocAssemble implements um, GitHub integration, it's sort of one way. Um, it's not two way. And as soon as you start working with somebody else that's also putting things in the project, maybe they're moving files around, things like that, it can get messy. And so, um, and we, we, for example, we saw that over the summer where it seemed like the only issue was that they had were working from an old project. Um, best practice we've arrived at is just create a new project for each new task branch thing that you're gonna do. Um, it just keeps things from getting messy, um, which maybe feels like, um, unsatisfactory, but um, if, if you do want to dig into like um, the way, um, I think in, in here there, I know it describes like what DocAssemble actually does and it'll make more, if you if you start to get your head around how GitHub works, it'll make more sense in there. And if you want to dive deep on how GitHub works, the, the Git um, documentation has everything you want to know about how it works, including a really great, um, Um, if you really want to know, I'm going to, I'm going to pull this up just because I think, um, there's a Git, um, book, um, it is entirely free and the first section, uh, getting started, uh, is really, if you, if you want to go down the rabbit hole and really understand why GitHub works, does things the way it does and how it works, um, this is very useful for creating kind of a mental model of what you're doing. I had real, I really struggled with for example, some of the vocabulary like pull requests. Pull requests are not intuitive in any way to me, that, that vocabulary term, but I understood it, why it's called that and how it does make sense after reading this. So if you really want to go down the rabbit hole, I recommend it. You definitely don't need to. Um, uh, all right, I want to 
wanted to have all the stuff open. Okay, so back to packages. We'll add a, a commit me message. Um, we usually describe what the commit does, adds a comment from interviewer one. Um, and again, we're going to ignore the install package on the server. It doesn't do anything we need. So now we're going to commit that. Okay, so now we should be able to go back and we should see two branches. And if we wanted to go in, we can see um, the dip, we can compare them, all that kind of stuff. So, um, thank you. Michelle is describing in the comments in more detail how those not creating a new plot project can cause problems. Um, I'll let you read that because I think it makes sense and I'll try to remember to grab it for the YouTube post when I do it. Um, okay. So we've got our, we've committed our second branch. Let's say that was the product of several days labor. So let's go back to the playground. We're gonna go back to manage projects and we're gonna create another project. And I'm gonna do this one quickly because we've already done it. Interviewer two, add comments. Or let's say interviewer two, uh, yeah, let's just say interviewer two, add comment. Um, and we're gonna do the exact same thing. We're gonna um, go to folders, packages, we're gonna pull see if it's still, yep, it's still in my clipboard. Um, we can pull from the main branch, which is probably what it looks like if you're two people working on the same interview, right? You're probably both pulling from main to do your work separately. And this, what this is going to demonstrate is um, a key problem. So the best practice here is to work on different parts of the interview. The way GitHub figures out if um, how to reconcile changes is it's a little more complex, but basically on line numbers. So if two people change the same line, um, as I'm doing here, I, I think what's going to happen is we're going to confuse GitHub and it's going to say it can't automatically merge this. That's what we're hoping is going to happen. So we're going to save that. We're going to go back to packages. And very quickly, we're going to try and commit um, to another new branch. Again, we're going to leave the install package on the server also alone. Probably should just go ahead and hide that at some point, but for now it's there. Um, and that'll take a moment and commit. Okay. Now, obviously, we have several projects here. And what we can probably do is just clean them all up, just delete, because we're done with these now. We don't need to use them again. Um, and so just periodically come in here and clean up the old ones. I'm going to leave this one because I'm not, you know what, I'm not going to leave that one. If I keep working on this, I'm going to go back and use the repo. So what we've got now is if we go to the main page here, we can see, okay, we've got these comments. So we can do it from here. Um, we can do it from here. Um, interviewer one, add comment. Um, we can create a new pull request. Wherever you click it, what we want to do is create a new pull request. Um, so this first one's going to be easy. It says able to merge. They can be automatically merged. Piece of cake. Um, now, if you're working with somebody else, you're obviously going to want to have a reviewer on here. And um, for example, I often ask Quentin uh, or Michelle um, to review mine. Um, and that's a way of saying, hey, double check my work here, make sure my code looks good. Um, in this case, sorry for messing up your notifications, Michelle and Quentin, but uh, in this case, I'm just I'm confident in what I've done. So I'm going to just create a, create a pull request. Um, it's going to tell me in a moment that it can merge automatically. There's no trouble here. Um, but what we can do is we can, if you click on commits, it'll give you, it'll tell you my descriptions of all the work I did. And if you're working with a team member, it's a good idea to make these descriptive. Each commit is sort of like a step in the process towards the goal of this topical branch. Um, so that's a good idea to do. Checks may or may not be all that helpful. If there are errors, it probably is helpful. And then under files change, you can see what it's done. This is difficult to read. Quentin seems to read this like he reads um, his first language, um, which I believe is English. <laughs> but um, but for me, it takes a little while to kind of parse what's happening here. In something this simple, it's easy. It's showing me that before line one, I added this comment. So, okay, no big deal. 
before I merge this, one of the, if you're a reviewer, if you're asked to review a repo or even not, you can use <laughs> Dutch is the first language. Oh, actually, it might be true. Um, uh, you can use review changes, and um, you can review changes. Say sometimes um, all it says is LGTM looks good to me, um, which is in the nature of an approval. If you're if you're asked to be a reviewer, you'll have the option to approve and request changes. Um, that's to review the thing overall. You can also um, review each individual line of it. And if you hover over it, you'll get a plus. Um, not a helpful comment. Please consider revising, <laughs> for example. Um, and you can either just add that comment or you can use that as part of your review. And then when you're done, um, you can do something like that. This is a really helpful process to store that um, those annotations in here because those discussions about should we change this line or not, um, kind of leave tracks. Um, it's the same reason we use issues, because they can be documentations of decisions made of why you did what you did and that sort of thing. I'm often thinking of, you know, we had summer students, now we're going to have fall students. Fall students are not the summer students. They have no idea what the summer students did unless we leave tracks. And so this is so on one more way of sort of sharing your brain with your future self, in most cases, or with future people who might need to work on this. So we don't really need reviewers. We're gonna go ahead and mer merge the pull request, confirm the merge. And then after you confirm your merge, you should delete your branch. Once you've used a topical branch, there's no reason to keep it around. It isn't gone forever. Um, very few things are gone forever in GitHub. Um, for example, this pull request is now closed, but you can always see it here under closed. Um, we can go look at that branch and uh, you can see um, active and stale branches. Um, I believe if we go to all, can we not see deleted branches? I'm really quite confident we can see deleted branches. I just can't remember how to find them. Um, but in any case, the record of the changes are in the pull request. So if we ever want to you know, be reminded, well, what, what did we change then? Why is it broken now is usually the question. I did this thing and now it's broken. Why? You go back here, you can check the files changed and see the change. Oh, this comment wasn't very helpful. That's probably why the interview's broken. Hopefully, I mean, that's obviously not true, but okay. Okay, so we've done away with one branch. Now we're gonna compare this one. Now I think we're gonna see can't automatically merge here. Don't worry, you can still create the pull request. So now we're gonna talk through merge conflicts. And this is where I think everybody started getting scared this summer when they're like, they, they're very comfortable committing to main. Um, they're very comfortable pulling out branches and playing around with branches. But when you have two people merging two changes that might be conflicting into the main thing, then it gets complicated. And this is why it's important to keep your branches, your projects narrow, right? To keep them small. Um, I'm just going to do this one thing at a time because there's way less to untangle. I recently did a series of major updates to the documentation website and I completely screwed up this part. And fortunately it all kind of went together, um, but if I had made mistakes, it would have been a nightmare to untangle. But we're gonna create the pull request anyway. And what we get now is I think it's gonna say it has conflicts that must be resolved. There's a few ways to do this. I'm gonna stay away from the command line entirely during this thing because I don't use the command line for Git. I use it for other things, but I don't use it for Git. I have always used either the web interface or GitHub Desktop, which I can show you in a bit too, if you're curious. Um, so I only use this one. So why are there conflicts? Well, I might wanna go see here, mm, commits, records, the messages don't really help me, but I can go to files change and see, um, okay, that doesn't really help me, but, um, but I know I've got changes. So let's go back here to the conversation view, which doesn't really describe what this is, but that's okay. So let's resolve conflicts. Okay, so what this does, so the one up top, you see these lines here that begins the change that is attached to this branch. Now we're merging interviewer to add comment, that branch into main. So this is the new one, and this is effectively the old one. I mean, it's a couple minutes old because I just did it a few minutes ago, but there it is. And so what we have to do is manually select this. It's a little clunky. We're so used to things being select A or B. That's not how this works. The way this works is we actually have to delete the lines we don't want 
and and leave the lines we do. And if you leave this in there, it now you've now you have a broken file. So that's why I say I think it's a little clunky. Um, but now it's done, and you you saw that Marcus resolve was grayed out until I finally did that last step. Um, and you know you can even change it. I, let's say I didn't actually want I wanted to merge the two, so I can actually take elements of both of them or do something completely new and say. Okay, now I'm set. This is how I want this line to look. So I'll mark it as resolved, and now I'll commit the merge. I guess this is a good point time to point out that when we talk about committing from the playground and committing from GitHub, those are actually slightly different things. Um, and so when I commit from the playground, I'm or when I commit from GitHub, I'm actually doing a slightly different thing. They result in the same thing, but what the the process that DocAssemble goes through for committing is different than this. In any point place, I'm going to commit this merge. And we'll, now we'll be taken back to the pull request view. So you see we're still in the pull request. And in this conversation view, um, now it shows us, um, now maybe I would have added some comments on what change to make there, and we would have had a back and forth about it. Not this time. Um, but now we should see all checks have passed. There are no conflicts with the main branch, and now we can merge. Um, there is this option here for rules. You, you can protect your, your repos by doing things like, for example, on some of our repos, it might be a good idea that it can only be merged after Quentin approves of the, of the, the pull request. Probably something will do at some point. Um, and it might be a good, when, whenever you're looking at mission critical stuff, it might be a good idea to do that. We can talk about rule sets in a different time when I understand them better. Um, but for now, we're just going to merge it. We're going to confirm the merge. We're always going to delete our branch. Michelle will get after you if you forget. <laughs> she reminds us she's good about reminding me. Um, OK, and so now we have our code. You've probably noticed that what you see here is not what you see in the playground, but we need to drill down into the file structure here. So. Renaming, if you haven't noticed before, renaming after um, after you've that used one based on that package name is actually a little bit weird. Um, there's a few steps involved. Haven't documented it yet, but I intend to. Um, but if we go into the data and in the questions folder, now we're going to see that YAML file. Um, and now it should have the interviewer one and two comment. Let's go ahead and copy this repo URL and let's create a new project. I'm going to name it the same thing I named it in the beginning, because from my perspective, I'm basically right back where I was. And um, I'm going to pull it back in. Um, and let's, oh, sorry, let's go to pull. And I'm going to pull from main. Now, I just got done, you know, always we're always going to pull from main. And then usually we're going to immediately or very quickly commit back to a new branch. Why might you not want to do that? Maybe I'm ready to share this interview with um, for preliminary feedback from somebody else um, in the document assembly line community, or um, or my my project partner, uh, my my teammate, or um, or maybe I'm ready for feedback from the decision makers and stakeholders that are that I'm responsible to on this interview I'm working on. Um, then we might want to bring it back in here to Maine just so that we can run it um, and do it as a demo. Um, otherwise, as soon as you pull from main, we're probably going to go back in here um, and um, and we're going to establish a new branch. And you can even do it immediately before you've made a single change. And your commit me message could just be something like establishing new branch um, or something like that. I'm not going to do it this time because I'm still working on this one and I'm not ready for that. Um, but as you could see here, now my merged comments are right there. So that in fairly quickly, I guess, in about a half an hour, is the team, the GitHub Doc Assemble team workflow um, that we recommend using. Emily asks, so you never develop directly in main, always with a separate branch. Well, let's put an asterisk by that. When might you develop directly in main? You might develop directly in main because you're the only one working on this. And, um, and it doesn't feel all that helpful to do this whole rigmarole of branches and pull requests. 
I tend to work directly in main um, while I'm uh, while I am working on sort of version 1.0. So I don't have anything. I don't have something launched yet. Um, I'm basically um, I'm basically still working on the draft. I might commit to main during that time because I haven't actually launched anything yet, um, and I'm the only one working on it. Other than that. Um, as Quentin says here, only hot fixes to main, meaning like I am doing a bug. Uh, there's a there's a bug request that I have 100% certainty is the right fix, and I'm putting it back into main because I need this thing working immediately. And usually that would be attached to it's going to get pulled, you know, back into your production server immediately um, or very quickly because you've got an action tied to it that will do that. Um, and I think that's right. Although I would say. Quinton is a very talented and experienced programmer who is able to do that. Um, I don't have the confidence um, to push hot fixes to almost anything um, DocAssemble wise, because I'm relatively new to DocAssemble. Now in my own projects, I often commit just to main because I know that this is a quick, you know, 1.2.13, you know, hot fix that will, you know, change a margin or um, fix a JavaScript bug error that I'm seeing, um, something like that. But as Chris points out, it's a good idea to create new branches anyway in case you really screw something up. It gives you a little bit of an easier um, sort of, if you think about, you know, a branch literally branches off of the main thing. And so you've got your code side by side before you pull it back into main. Um, I think it's it's 100% of best practice. Um, if you decide to commit to main before you get to version 1.0 of your project, I'm not going to criticize you. Um, Matt says, asks about um, version numbers in here. Um, I, I like using version numbers. I wasn't using them for the purposes of this. Um, I don't think a lot of our, I'm not sure about this. Maybe Quentin or Michelle can um, respond on this one. I'm not sure if we actually use version numbers on many of our, um, on our repos because GitHub's changelog itself is kind of um, is kind of its own sort of changelog of the thing. Um, I am a fan of version numbers for my own stuff, and I like using them. Quinton uses them for definitely for sure on the assembly line um, repository. Um, so you can see um, how that works. Actually, let me pull here, um, and uh, you can see that he uses the tags feature of, of GitHub though to do that. Um, I don't. Um, I'm not sure if he does it in, in the project number, but I think it's a good idea. Um, and if you're looking for a way to sort of a, if you're looking for a semantic, a way to like have a structured approach to change logs, I really like this keepachangelog.com um, structure for it. Um, I hope this is okay with uh, Quentin and Michelle because I'm just pulling this out. But this is what I use for my own change logs. Um, I use this format and I use this numbering system um, where, um, oh, Quinton makes version number changes in main, not in the feature branch. Got it. Um, but if you're interested in any, you're not sure how to use version numbers, I think this is a nice guide for it, as well as a nice way to annotate what, what you're doing as you go. Um, so you should check that out. Um, and Michelle says if you're using PyPy packages, um, is it PP, PyPy, PyP, P? <laughs> I'm not sure how to pronounce that. <laughs> pi, pi, pi. Okay, um, pi, pi, uh, whatever you like. Um, but yeah, if you uh, if you want to, that keep a change log is one way to do it. Quinton uses tags on main uh, when he releases a new one, and he uses that feature to sort of gather the um, uh, the changes and annotate it in a way that's really helpful on some of the big um, GitHub repositories that we have. If you have a big interview, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, let me see. What else can we cover about GitHub? Let's go back to this page um, and look at some of the best practice. We've covered um, committing your code. We've covered creating pull requests. Um, we've covered resolving conflicts. Let's be, let's be fair, uh, resolving merge conflicts is usually more complicated than what I demonstrated but the fundamental approach is the exact same. And hopefully this demystifies it and de-scares people about it. Um, we've talked about reviewing pull requests. Um, I think reviewing is super helpful. Um, 
Michelle has been super helpful on this documentation as I work on it in particular. Um, Quentin swears I'm helpful, but I'm not so sure um, <laughs> with reviewing his changes. Um, best practices. Um, commit early and often. The save button in the playground only saves it here. And um, whereas if you really want a version that you can go back to, then you need to commit. I hope everybody watching this realizes this, but um, I commit all the time. And the result is that a lot of my commits have really unhelpful names on them, um, which I feel bad about sometimes. Um, for example, if you look at my most recent pull request, um, which was actually the third pull request on the same branch, which is a little silly, but I will often save, just say saving WIP work in progress. Um, oh, thanks for reminding me, Chris, about how to include issues and close it when you merge a new branch in the main. I will cover that. Um, saving WIP is not particularly helpful, but I don't like going to bed without saving. Um, and so uh, I'll often do something like saving work in progress on this thing is a better way to do it. Um, but Michelle didn't remind me to do it that way <laughs> until after I'd done some of these. So um, I think that's actually way more helpful is to say saving work in progress on this problem. So at least there's a little bit of a trail there of what you were actually working on instead of just WIP is not that helpful. Um, so commit early and often. Um, use issues. We haven't talked about issues yet, so let's talk about issues now. Um, in in every repository are issues, and you'll see on most of the lit lab repositories are lots of issues. There are some best practices about how to use issues in the documentation, how to name them. Um, name them so that it would be helpful to somebody who um, isn't you, right? Naming an issue projects slash SEO, not helpful. Um, at least add a projects slash SEO page is a little more helpful. Um, but it's really important too to say um, you can add checklists and descriptions so that whoever is going to pick up this issue and do it, and let's not assume it's going to be you, um, is able to see this and um, uh, and understand what needs to be done to call this complete. Um, you, you'll see at the bottom the it's you know that you can close an issue, you can mark it complete by closing it. So make sure that this sentence that names the issue is something that can be closed. We have some here that are hard to close. Um, and uh, I need to go through and triage some of those. And it's OK to leave placeholders and, and change them and change the titles later, um, but it's hard to do. One of the ways we use these with students, and I hope that some of those repositories will show this, is um, uh, over the summer, we were using Um, issues and we were using the question late. We created a question label and we used that one. And that way, every time we met with the um, the trial court, we would just filter this to do this. And each of these um, would be here's the question we need you guys to resolve for us. And then in each of those, uh, we can probably see the closed ones. Um, hopefully, uh, there's some documentation on them. So on these ones with comments. Um, they documented the answer they got, um, hopefully added some reasoning for why we were doing that, um, and then described the change they made to make it work. Um, and so that was a really helpful way that we were using issues uh, on our work over the summer to make it easy. So we need an answer to this question, create an issue. Um, this isn't working, create an issue. Um, and then that creates a to-do list for you. Um, and you can do it in issues or you can do it in projects. I'm a big fan of projects. And um, on that, Here's a template that I've created for an interview project, which I'm going to show you. Um, but here's, uh, let's see. So on the tax lien interview, all those issues are here in the backlog. You can assign them. You can move them forward, whatever. We're going to be asking students to pick up this project later in the semester. I have some cleaning up and preparation to do here. I'm not just going to leave it like this. I'm going to make sure that these are clear, that they have the right people assigned to them. But um, these project boards can be a really great visual um, guide to what needs to be done here. Um, I have been working on a template here um, that is built around in the documentation under Get Started, under Interview Projects, there's a roadmap. I just published this page. It's a new page. 
the project template is built around that. So if you wanted to, you can visit this, it's public, you can use this template um, and it'll walk you through things like having a project kickoff meeting um, and it'll link to the relevant documentation that applies to that. Um, it's, it's, it's written not just for our own projects, it's meant to be a general purpose project template. Okay. That was issues. Projects can pull in issues from multiple repositories, um, but let's talk about how to close an issue with a project. Um, so let's go to my, still in here? Yep. Um, so let's create an issue um, and let's just close this issue with a commit. Um, and we're gonna create this one. Uh, and all you need to do is take note that it's number three. Um, so let's go back here and we'll go to folders, packages, um, and we're gonna go back down to GitHub and You'll note I haven't made any changes to the file. GitHub lets us commit anyway, not a big deal. Um, um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna close, closes issue or closes number three. Um, you can do closes, fixes, resolves. Um, look this up and see what the keywords are. Um, Uh, Emily asks, is there another way to do it? Closes, closed, fixes, fixed. I think resolves actually works too, but I'm not positive. Um, so if we put that in here, um, and I'll get to your question, Emily. If we get this in here, resolves number, or uh, let's say closes number three, and if we commit this, it should work. Oh, oh, because there's nothing to change. That's why, because um, I was wrong. You actually have to do make a change. So um, now this, if I wrote this in the commit message, it wouldn't work, but it will here. So let's go back to the packages. You do have to change it. My bad. Um, closes number three. Now we should be able to commit it. There we go. And if we go back and look at our issues, it was already closed when we got there. It was closed with that commit. Okay, so let's create a new issue. Um, and um, so we can just straight up reference them by going, just type the hash symbol and you can reference, um, we worked on that one and we can actually reference page re um, pull requests the same way. They they actually come, you'll notice that I, the first issue was issue number three, and that's because number one and number two were both pull requests. Um, and so you can just reference them. Um, and when we submit that, it's gonna link directly to the issue and give us a little bit of context on it. So yes, um, in pretty much any comment or, or field body uh, on, and potentially even on a, I don't think it works in titles, but let's just see. No, it doesn't work in titles, but it does work in um, any comment body. You can you can use that hash symbol and it will pull up the, the most recent ones, I think. Um, or if you know the numbering you want to use, you can do that too. Um, so uh, that's an easy way to link to them. I, I love issues. I think um, because of the versatility, you can associate them with milestones. You can plug them into projects. I think it's a very versatile way to keep track of everything you have to do. I have a couple of bookmarks for um, <laughs> for all of our stuff. So I was trying to figure out like, you know, what are all of uh, issues, what are all the issues that we have on document assembly line projects? Well, that's a lot, 794 issues. Part of that is because Michelle loves issues even more than I do. Um, <laughs> and I don't blame her for it. Uh, so I was trying to filter them more by la those labeled in, you know, enhancements, uh, say a feature request. Um, and this is a very clunky long search string because I had to manually enter all the repos because I couldn't figure out another way to do it. I don't think there is another way to do it. Um, but if you, you can, we use, anyway, the bottom line was we use issues a lot. They're very helpful. Um, you can sort them by date and things like that. I'm overdue to triage a lot of stuff, obviously. 
Um, but uh, I find issues very helpful and I like to use them a lot. So um, you can assign them to people, obviously, which um, you can create them assigned. And I think, yeah, you can assign, these are all the issues that are assigned to me and, and are open. Um, so you can use them in a lot of different ways. And as you learn to navigate the search screen, um, you can do even more with it. I've got you know, a bunch of saved searches on repo, repos and issues and things like that. Um, so any more questions? I feel like I'm talking really fast and I think it's because I haven't actually presented anything in a while, um, but also because I know you'll be able to rewatch this. And so you can slow me down if you need to. Um, but yeah, hopefully that, hopefully that helps. Um, I would love to cover more if people have more. Um, let me briefly go down the, the page here just to see if there's anything else I want to, um, to mention here. Um, troubleshooting errors. Um, <laughs> I had error number one. I hadn't technically made any changes. Um, you obviously have to have permissions for the repository. If you did the first parts where you uploaded it yourself, that should be easy. And you cannot commit from doc assemble into GitHub if there are is a merge conflict to resolve, um, I believe, right? It won't, it just won't commit. Um, in that case, you need to sort of manually merge them, which oh, create make a new branch, commit the changes there, and then work out the merge conflict in GitHub is the the way to resolve that. Um, I think that's all I have. That's a lot of stuff that I wanted. To, that I'd like to make sure that um, that students know, and um, oh right, and as as I think Quentin and Michelle mentioned, if you mention an issue that like if you if you do that, close an issue with a pull request in a pull request comment, it won't close the issue until the pull request is merged. Um, right, Michelle's on the same wavelength here, same brain. Um, it'll only close it when you merge the code. Um, so you can say that in a commit on a branch without immediately closing the issue or in, in a pull request comment without immediately closing the issue. Um, I think that's everything I wanted to make sure students knew from the summer and that I hope is useful to everyone working on interviews. Um, yeah, if there are no more questions, I will go ahead and grab some of the comments from this, some of the questions so that it's, um, there are some really helpful links shared. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and close the video. And thanks everyone, I really appreciate you. You're a great audience for my very first, first Wednesday workshop. Bye everyone. <laughs>